Yep, so we're recording the meeting. So I think everyone has to agree the recording. Should give you a little pop-up. Um, so welcome. Thank you all for joining us for this meeting. Uh, Doctors for America, we're part of the gun violence prevention group um, doing a lot of great anti-racism work. So we're very happy to see you guys all here. Um, so the agenda for tonight is we're going to introduce uh, what DFA has been doing in this realm. And then we're going to have a really great conversation um, with a couple of our steering committee members and one of our Copello fellows at Doctors for America about uh, racism and its impacts on healthcare and impacts on people who work in healthcare as well. So um, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, you can feel free to do that. Um, and then I'll just take a second to introduce myself as well. Uh, I'm Grace Walter. I'm one of the um, committee, the uh, co-chairs for the National Gun Violence um, Prevention Steering Committee for Doctors for America, and I'm a third-year family medicine resident at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., so I'm almost done with residency, um, and I got involved in this work uh, a couple of years ago, and then we kind of uh, took an anti-racism stand uh, at Doctors for America and decided to make that part of our um, gun violence prevention group. So I'm excited to meet everyone and I'm reading all of your messages in the chat, so thank you. Um, and we have a couple of other members of our steering committee here as well, Dr. Kelly Henry, and then we also have um, Dr. Genevieve Tuvison. So welcome to them as well. Um, and I'm gonna take a moment here to just let our two panelists also introduce themselves. So Dr. Um, Wamo and Kayla Hicks are joining us. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves as well. Thank you, um, Allison. And uh, thank you all for having us here today. Um, I am a steering committee member for DFA Gun Violence Prevention. Um, and I am currently the president and CEO of Sustain Equity Group, which is a national nonprofit that um, is a leadership development and network for Black women and girls that are working in violence prevention, specifically on the front lines or behind the scenes in research and public health, public safety and policy and mental health. Um, and I have been doing this work for eight years in gun violence prevention, about 30 years in advocacy and organizing and coalition building. And I am also, fun fact, a retired bounty hunter. And I am still a private detective. I do those things when I need to have some fun. So that's me. Yeah, and good evening, everyone. I'm Chidi Wamo. I am in my third year of residency, psychiatry at Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. And also honored to be one of the Capello Fellows and Appreciate the opportunity here just to share some of my experiences and perspectives. And I'm um, really looking forward to just engaging in conversation tonight. So thank you very much. So before we get started, uh, I just wanted to let you guys all know too that this is definitely intended to be sort of more of a conversation. Um, and so we definitely want engagement from everyone if you're able. Um, so feel free to chime in whenever we're planning on having more of like a 20% us talking and 80% everyone else talking. So we'd love to hear from everyone as well. Um, and at the end of the session, we're going to kind of chat for a few minutes just about what you would want to see from this group moving forward into 2022, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so we'll get started on our program. Um, we kind of developed this uh, idea for a talk out of um, a couple of our other programs that we've had and just kind of wanting to talk about the impacts of racism on healthcare. I think it's obviously everyone here knows a very important topic that we need to talk more about. Um, and so I'm going to let our panelists start with um, a question. Just can you um, tell us how, this is kind of a broad question, but how um, racism impacts healthcare and we'll open it up to the group as well so we can all chat about it and we'll just see where the conversation goes. Um, I'll, I will start, Alice, if I can say that um, for me as a Black woman, my experience with racism um, in the medical field has been uh, more so negative stereotypes of Black women and, you know, primarily the angry Black woman, woman or also the myth that um, black women feel less pain um, than other people. And so we get 
discounted or just, you know, credited when we're explaining what it is we're feeling or going through. And then I've seen in my work, um, you know, as I had often over the years shown up to crime scenes and or hospitals after a shooting, and you'll see the distraught family members who are um, ultimately, you know, being stereotyped again, based on their behavior um, of trauma, right? Being impacted by trauma, uh, they are immediately considered as, you know, distant, a problem or an issue or no real concern about what is happening in those few first moments of people arriving um, to a scene that's changing their lives and that's, you know, trauma filled. And so, you know, the, those negative impacts, um, have always followed me around and I've always dealt, as I mentioned in one of our last talks, uh, when it comes to black women, it's not foreign to hear when we go to the doctors, uh, the first thing is, is that everything must be because of our weight. Um, every problem is because of that. And I've seen lots of women that have had, you know, some serious issues where they might've had tumors and they were just being told that lose weight um, and, you know, thankfully somewhere along the line, a specialist, uh, let them know that it was beyond what they were being told. And so I think that impacts us. Um, and I'm sure Chidi can talk more to this psychologically, the damage that it does to us and our families. And it's just like the, you know, our, our children, how they see police treating adults and some children, clearly, um, it, it starts off early where people are, um, dreading showing up to the doctors. And so as such, we can see with COVID-19, the results of, I think, um, unprocessed trauma or not being allowed to show up in that way. Yeah, thanks, Kayla. I think you brought up lots of really good points um, in that we see kind of this uh, disparities, especially in communities most affected by trauma. Um, especially the stereotypes. Um, Chidi, I wonder if you could speak on this question, but also talk about, um, you know, some of the psychological impacts as well. And if anyone else has any comments or any questions for the, for any of us, please let us know. Yeah, I mean, um, it's definitely a loaded question, but a, a necessary question. Um, just to give a little background. So uh, my father's actually Nigerian. He immigrated from Nigeria in the 1980s following one of the civil wars uh, that plagued the country, basically. And he didn't envision the country having the future that would provide a sense of fulfillment, I guess, to his, his family. Um, so he moved, he immigrated to the U.S. in the 1980s. Um, and my mother is actually African-American. She's from Philadelphia. Um, so those two cultural identities really shaped my experience going up, just seeing, um, I guess you could say, just a, having a minority viewpoint from different angles. Um, and it was actually my mom's side that got me interested in, in medicine. Um, there's a common colloquialism in, with Nigerians that you can either be a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. Um, but it was really my mom's side, my American side, that really cultivated that. Um, so I just was nurtured, thankfully, to have that uh, passion um, to go to medical school. And initially, as I finished medical school, I matched into surgery and I had all intentions of being a surgeon. Um, and I was here in Atlanta at Morehouse. I don't know if people are familiar with Atlanta, but Grady Hospital is the level one trauma center here. So I was on primarily for, I'd say about four months, one of the, I was on the trauma service, notoriously high value. And a lot of the patients that were coming in were young, uh, primarily African-American men that had either been victims themselves of gunshot wounds, carjacking, stabbings, or um, on the other side, perpetrating the violence. And as an intern, um, I had the opportunity to get to know them on a deeper level because uh, the lower residents, we weren't really in the operating room as much. So I had time to go through the chart, speak with them. I was there with family members. And through the course of that, I was able to really glean uh, the circumstances that led them into that trauma bay. And I just couldn't ignore this feeling of wanting to address uh, some of these factors more upstream prior to them even coming into the, 
the to the uh, emergency room, the trauma bay. Unfortunately, a lot of them succumb to their injuries. Um, so ironic to be more on the preventive side. And those conversations really sharpen my desire for advocacy and um, addressing root causes. So that um, led me to uh, transition to psychiatry. So I went through ERAS again and reapplied. And um, now I'm a psychiatry resident. And um, I'm excited to be here because I think psychiatry is very preventive. And um, as I've gone through my training, um, it's really helped me to view people, patients, citizens from a developmental lens. What is happening from really the time children are in the womb to their presentation at the clinic, whether that's um, at the hospital, the VA, the child adolescent clinic, and and Morehouse, uh, we serve a primarily uh, underserved population, very uh, minority population, immigrant, African American, um, and the stories you hear um, really makes it clear how they arrived at their illness, how they arrived to the symptoms they're having. And a lot of what I've just learned more and more and more, even being born here, is just the structural forces that are driving a lot of the people I see um, to health crises, whether that's mental health, whether that's in the primary care clinic. And um, I just see a recurring theme of just unaddressed structural trauma, racial trauma that is manifesting as these psychiatric and um, other diseases, hypertension, depression, um, just a lot of trauma and just violence that a lot of children are being exposed to. And I think now is a great time. I think COVID has really unmasked again the inequities in this country, but I think people are really paying attention. And I'm just thankful to be here at this time um, to be able to address some of these, these issues. Um, more specifically to answer the question in terms of racism as it pertains to my specialty, psychiatry. Um, we've known for a long time, African-Americans are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, which then leads to being administered more um, severe medications, antipsychotics, and having those side effects down the line. Um, less likely to be diagnosed, less likely to be treated for depression. Um, and really, what I think is the most important and most devastating is what is not diagnosed. And what is not diagnosed is the trauma um, that has now led to the school to prison pipeline. So we're losing a generation of children who have been victims of their circumstances and due to systemic policies, due to just um, lack of education around their neighborhood and environment are now funneled into all these different systems. And we as adults, uh, psychiatrists see the ramifications of that. So that's another reason why I decided to pursue my fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry. To again, get back at that question that I mentioned earlier about um, the younger men coming into the emergency room and being on the preventive side, um, especially children and adolescents. Um, so that's just my two cents for now. Um, but just thank you for being here and hopefully we can have a fruitful, fruitful conversation. Yeah, thanks so much. That's, you brought up a lot of really good points. Um, I think uh, kind of one thing that you all both brought up and maybe we can talk about this as a group a little bit more too. Um, I think something that we experience in medicine is a lot of, um, you know, racism or even like unconscious or implicit bias when we're in the office. And, um, you know, like Kayla was saying, um, not prescribing pain medications or over diagnosing schizophrenia, all of these things are tied to racism. I know, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have seen it in the hospital or seen it in our practices. Um, and it can be challenging to kind of work through these things when you're on a team of maybe physicians who are sometimes for me as a resident, like attending physicians will see it and things like that. So I just want to open it up to the group and we can kind of talk about experiences if you guys are comfortable with that um, and just have a conversation about how to have these tough conversations in medicine. I don't know if anyone has a specific example to start with or I mean, COVID brings up a lot of disparities, I think as well. 
Well, I'm a family practitioner, uh, semi-retired now, who has a, a secondary specialty in family medicine, not residency, uh, a, a fellowship. And um, I've always, I mean, from, from my perspective, I, when my patients say, what is your specialty? I say, it's you. Because uh, if, they're, if your specialty is the patient you're dealing with, that means you have to know their context, their nexus, where they're coming from um, in, in every way and uh, have a basic underlying understanding of them and be their advocate. And mm -hmm. so I found myself, you know, as I mean, I was born Jewish, I have black people in my family, my wife, my kids, but I found myself wanting to prove to my patients of color that I was there for them. And sometimes it was more of an uphill battle because there's a lot of pre-existing, like uh, Grace was saying, there's a lot of pre-existing um, uh, preconceptions and notions and, and stereotypes that physicians have. So I think maybe the first thing you have to do as a physician is see racism in yourself, is to and get in there. And you're never going to be able to completely root it out, but you have to work on it constantly. Because when you're dealing with a person's life that is a precious cargo and they deserve you to be fully there for them and there, and, and if you're not um, congruent with their culture or their race, you even more have to show that you're there for them because they're gonna be skeptical that you are and they have every right to be. That was extremely well said. I love that answer. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think that's a really, really important. Um, and I also think it's important that you brought up, you know, rooting it out in ourselves. I think I recently had this conversation uh, in a class that I was helping teach at Georgetown to some medical students. And we were talking about kind of how everyone has some kind of bias. And, you know, as long as you're recognizing that and working against it, I think that's something really important to recognize. Um, Susan, did you have a comment too? I did, thank you. Um, I'm probably the oldest one here and over my lifetime, I've, I've seen a, a lot of changes in healthcare. Uh, one thing that hasn't really changed enough though is um, the disparities for race. Women used to be treated very poorly going to the doctor. If you wrote things down on a piece of paper, you were neurotic and given a Valium. Um, everything got a Valium. And that has significantly changed. And I would like to see that same change in um, African Americans and other minorities. There are two resources, though, that have been very helpful to me um, and to people that I've talked with. One is, well, actually, uh, one is a book, Medical Apartheid. And if you yes. have it, it's one of the best reads on pointing things out and um, making things, making people aware of things that have gone on that they may not be aware of. I mean, sometimes people say, oh, because they're not aware of it. They've never opened their eyes. They've never been taught it. And I do think a lot of things have come out positively uh, from the COVID that people are now seeing things that have been there for forever um, that was never brought to their attention. The other is black man in a white coat. And then the resource for health disparities. One of the things that I'm working on is um, a single payer healthcare system, because what can we do um, in the infrastructure to level the playing field? And to me, one of the most important is everybody have equal access, equal reimbursement, instead of having, um, insurance be subpar and having 90 million people being underinsured or, or uninsured. So that would be an interesting, I'd be interested in thoughts on that. 
Well, I, I have a little different perspective. And uh, Susan, um, you're not the oldest one in this room, I'm sure. Um, I'm in Portland, Maine. I'm a uh, semi-retired internist. And uh, as a retirement career, I have taken on uh, teaching duties. And I teach uh, medical students from an offshore medical school. Our students, um, many of them, would be in American medical schools if they could be. And as you look at our students, um, it is striking how many of them are members of minority populations. A lot of them are Hispanic. Uh, many are from the Indian subcontinent and uh, from, from Canada. And uh, many are black and interesting to me, and it's got me scratching my head a little bit. Um, many of our black students are from Africa or from a Caribbean nation and are much less likely to be an African-American. So what's going on there? I, my interest uh, is to level the playing field in medical education. If we can provide uh, a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant who looks like the patient who has had some of the same cultural experiences as the patient, uh, the patient will feel more comfortable with the medical system and will connect. And we know that connecting with your provider is important for good medical care. So what's going on there? I would like to believe that there's, there isn't conscious racism in the selection of medical students for admission to American and Canadian medical schools. Um, I imagine that um, we're seeing the results of structural racism, uh, whereby uh, students of color have been denied opportunities for success, which might uh, enable them to qualify for admission to an American medical school. Meanwhile, we're working hard to educate these folks, uh, some of whom are very talented and will make fine doctors and hope to be able to turn them loose so that they can provide good care to everybody, including to minorities. Um, I'll jump in here. Um, I am... I want to challenge Margaret and Susan on the age thing. Um, I think Alan and I may be uh, up there in terms of uh, an adequate challenge. I want to second the uh, medical apartheid book. Uh, I think it's really going to become the Bible of, uh, of uprooting medical racism. Uh, I'm a retired cardiologist, and then I worked in uh, adult primary care. And it was, how did I go 40 plus years practicing medicine and be oblivious to so much of this history of medical racism? And there's a tremendous amount of scholarship now, not only medical apartheid, but cast and how to become an anti-racist and uh, um, whatever the book is about uh, dying of whiteness. And, uh, you know, there, there, there's an awful lot out there, not to mention uh, numerous articles. So that whole idea of the importance of medical education, my niece is uh, a first year medical student at uh, University, uh, Chicago Medical School, and they're reading medical apartheid in their first year, or at least some of it. And so I think that's, uh, that's very hopeful to see. I mean, um, and this uh, horrible legacy of denying uh, people's pain. Um, my, my dear friend is one of the world's experts on sickle cell disease in Oakland Children's. And uh, he sees that all the time. And you, uh, there's, there's published accounts of sicklers waiting longer than other 
pain patients in the ER and it being directly attributable to race and them having sickle cell disease and these anecdotal experiences of sicklers uh, getting dressed up while the, you know, when they're in crisis before they're going into the ER. So they're not seen as trying to score drugs. Uh, and these, um, uh, these studies on medical students and residents showing the misperception about uh, uh, black patients having thicker skin and you know more insensitive uh, nerve endings. So um, somehow we've we've totally failed in the education realm uh, in terms of this. But um, I, I think this is part of the huge um, the, the huge uh, job that we need to do. But not only in the people who are coming up. Uh, and the people who are already in practice. And, uh, you know, when it became clear that uh, the profession wasn't doing a very good job in end of life care and in pain care, um, I had to take uh, continuing medical education courses in those uh, areas to get my, my license renewed. Uh, why not do that in uh, medical racism? Why not make it a prerequisite before you get your license renewed? I mean, it's very easy to make a, uh, a test and the education that you need to pass it on the web. There are an awful lot of people who are an experts in this field who could, who could do that. And um, why, not, why not make that a prerequisite? I mean, is it really more important to, uh, to provide end of life care if you're not uh, attending to uh, uprooting medical racism? I, I think a, a very good argument can be made that they're equally important. So um, I think, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's wonderful that you're having this uh, discussion and this is the kind of uh, work that needs to be spread widely throughout the profession. So uh, really happy to be here and to share in it. You know, recently uh, that there, there are some IEDs planted in the path that seem to be totally devoid of intent, uh, but are really, kind of built into medicine practice. Uh, lately, I've been reading a lot about uh, creatinine clearance and uh, the differential. Uh, and, and this is something I have taken as Bible gospel truth, my whole practice. I never even questioned it. Uh, the fact that creatinine differs in dark-skinned people from light-skinned people. Well, the dark-skinned people are, are identified by their, their designation of what they are. So a light-skinned Black person would have an African-American converted creatinine clearance where a darker-skinned white person or a person who identifies themselves as white wouldn't. So I mean, it's, a, it's total hocus pocus and scientism, but it's being passed off as medicine. And, you know, I was trying to explain it to my um, nephew, whose mother is in the hospital and, and about creatinine clearance. And she, and, uh, and I looked at my own hospital, which is supposedly really progressive and it's still the standard of care there to, uh, to if you're, self-described as African-American or described by your doctor as African-American, your kidney function is defined by your race. And any comments on that? Well, I can make a comment on it. And as a resident, we also learned that in medical school and um, when I got to residency and was like ordering labs and you get one that's for it specifically says like GFR African-American and GFR non-African-American. And I think it can be really a dangerous thing, actually. Like sometimes you get 
such a difference that you're not even sure what to do and okay, what medications do I prescribe now? And, and I think it just, it really kind of, it can be dangerous for the patient. So I, I've stopped using it in my own practice, but there's a lot of studies out there to- Hospital kind of, labs and clinics still use it as a rule. Mm -hmm. Answer me. Uh, I, I have a comment on that. The, uh, the other fallout of, of the uh, creatinine clearance business is that the uh, improvement, if you want to put it in quotation marks, of African-American creatinine clearance moves them down the list for kidney transplants because they have better, better kidney function, so they're less likely to get a transplant. And it, it's totally bogus. Another example are uh, ACE inhibitors. When, uh, when ACE inhibitors first came out, the detail man, this is when we could actually see detail men, which uh, is a whole other story. Uh, the, the detail men came around and they specifically said, you know, you don't want to use this in your African-American patients. Well, you know, for some African-American patients, it may be the treatment of choice, but if you're defining it by a political designation about what you think their race is or what they say their race is, they may not be getting the appropriate medicine. It's very similar kind of thing and it's ingrained. Yeah, and I'll even add with um, psychiatry, um, when we use the medications for agitation, like Haldol, it's commonly stated that um, younger African-Americans um, require higher doses. And I think that's one of the reasons we see the higher doses, higher rates of dystonia and those severe side effects. Because um, the way it's, it was presented to me was that it was a genetic reason for, the, for their reaction to the medication. But I'm actually now just, just wondering, and I have over the past few years, is it more just bias where, say, an emergency room physician will see an African-American, assume they're aggressive, and then titrate up that dose versus, to say, an older uh, patient or someone of a, of a different race? Yeah, the only way to know somebody's genetics is to do genetic testing, mm -hmm, not exactly. by looking at them. Exactly. I did want to throw a question out to uh, Ms. Hicks. Um, and I know we're talking a lot of medical jargon, but from your perspective, um, how in the trauma lane or the, the gun violence uh, arena, how do you think um, some of the psychiatric failures of the medical profession have contributed to uh, the families and um, clients that you've worked with? Judy, that's a good question. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to hold me with that for a second. You're gonna probably have to remind me because I'm gonna go back for a second to, and I might say this wrong, Dr. Werblin, am I saying your name wrong? Um, you know, when you mentioned uh, black and brown, I had immediately began to think about the Willie Lynch letters, right? The making of a slave and how the medical society is still pretty much in that space. And even thinking about the National Medical Association, why it exists, why it's there. Um, it drives me to think that the value of the bigger part of your work um, with DFA uh, should really focus on the internal issues, right? First, thinking about how do you fix what's going on within your own space? Uh, it's very traumatizing for me and almost overwhelming. I, I, I don't often get emotional, but to listen to you all, um, um, this is not a movie. This is hey. real. Like this is happening sure. right now, and it's, it's, it's all for you, me. technically. Um, and so it becomes, um, tr it's traumatic, uh, and I don't know how Katie, as a person of color, 
uh, is able to process. I'm sorry, that's my seven and a half pound dog. She thinks she's a pit bull, but she doesn't know she's not. So she's barking at the trash guys, picking up the trash. Onyx, no. Um, and so, you know, Chidi, I don't know how you're impacted by this, but this takes uh, a lot out of me. Um, and it made me remember something I'd forgotten. Uh, so many things have happened, but I remember when I had my son, my 24 year old son. Um, and I remember right after giving birth, looking at um, his father and saying, you know, at the time, my, my, my husband looking at him saying, something's wrong, something's wrong. I don't feel right, something's wrong. And the nurse just walked right out of the room. And he's like, hey, wait, she said something's wrong. And she kept walking. And within seconds, I had a seizure. And I just remember all of those terrible feelings. And they just came to the surface to realize that this is all happening now. And I'm really appreciative and humbled by the fact that each one of you are here right now. Um, and I mean each one of you. Because I know you're, we often joke around and say you're on your 38th hour and some of you probably are truly 24 hours awake um so i'm really grateful that you're willing to change the, the narrative and the conversations that are being had amongst your walls and chidi to hopefully answer your question um I, you know what i will say uh, without getting into what i experienced with so many families because i, I experienced it on high volumes um, daily, and it's just becoming so overwhelming is that when I'm dealing with gun violence specifically, we know that that exposure to gun violence, um, it changes the chemistry in the brain, right? And so with that being said, you, what I've witnessed is that a lot of medical experts, experts don't even acknowledge that post-traumatic stress disorder or antisocial behavior, whatever is being displayed or experienced, depression, whatever it is in individuals that are showing up in the emergency room and or your offices, it's like, it's like science doesn't matter for the black and brown person, more specifically talking about a black American, that um, is living in poverty where we see high concentration um, concentration of, of, of violence and crime. You know, it's not a what's wrong with them conversation. Even with, with me, it, with me, I've had a traumatic childhood. I didn't grow up poor, I didn't grow up in the hood, but I've had very traumatic childhood and I've been exposed to a lot of violence. But for me, when I show up in doctor's offices or sometimes just talking amongst medical experts, someone like me, I am, you speak well. Um, and, and so because I don't come from poverty, then I must be able to tolerate more or I can't be sick like them or something of the sort. So I believe that 95.5%, not a verifiable number, I know you guys work on evidence, but should really focus on what your individual biases are or what they may be, and also what, what's going on around you, and how can you impact the things around you. And as a non-medical expert, I certainly take a look at what you all do and think to myself, does it make sense or is it hard to think about if you're trying to treat someone internally, would you start treating them externally? Would you put a Band-Aid on it? Would you put peroxide on it? Like how would you treat something um, that's happening internally, externally? And so that's the, the, the way that I look at things now is when I, when I see medical experts not remembering that, you know, these are real lives and real people and that you may not understand or know because your interaction might be limited with people of color, particularly black, and that are in poverty and coming out of violent communities, that there could be some trauma there that is unprocessed. And more importantly, do you know what that looks like and what that does to a person? 
uh, Chidi, I hope that answered in some small way. You know, there's a book called Post Traumatic Slave Disorder, and it uh, it talks about um, exactly that and the and the piggybacking of trauma on on generational trauma, adding on individual trauma to that. Uh, and I um, uh, I think that the work, the ACEs work and like um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris are really starting to pull back the curtain on what uh, Kayla Hicks is talking about is that you don't look at somebody and estimate their trauma, you test them. And you test them not when they're an adult, you test them when they're a child, because that's where it all begins. And that's where all the neuroendocrine stuff starts that changes their bodies and creates disease like depression, cardiac disease, cancer, stuff like that. That was the first thing I was going to say. And then the second thing I know that um, Jeff Ritterman knows Melanie Turvalon, and she gave the speech at my medical school graduation at UCSF in 1980. And she brought up some of these points way back then. If you ever can read her speech, I really strongly suggest it because that this is what she was talking about um, 41 years ago. Do you have anything to say about that, Jeff? I mean, I know you know Melanie too. You're muted. Uh, well, um, Melanie and um, her writing partner, uh, Jan Murray Garcia, are the uh, creators of the term um, cultural uh, humility as opposed to cultural competency. And they're writing a book on that. Um, and you sort of get the idea from the title and um, Melanie's uh, speech, I can send it to you if you, you like, because I, I have a copy. I mean, they're really pioneers in this kind of work, but um, it's gone unrecognized for a long period of time. Uh, but uh, you, you can look for their names, uh, Melanie Turvalon, T-E-R-V-A-L-O-N, and I'll put it in the chat and um, Jan Murray Garcia, and they're, they're just giants. And maybe you wanna have them on your next uh, um, webinar on this. Uh, every time I ask them to do something, they tell me that they're too busy finishing the book, but maybe it's finished by now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of sad to think that there have been people who have been pioneers in this work for you know, more than a decade and their work has kind of gone unrecognized. Um, but uh, they're, they're among my teachers. But you know, more tragic is that people like Kayla, her, her pain has gone unrecognized and I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, pain around childbirth or pain in a sickle cell crisis. I'm talking about emotional pain of um, uh, you know, is what the invisible man, uh, Ralph Ellison's book was about being invisible to providers who are looking straight at you and don't want to see what they're looking at and don't want to hear what's underneath that's producing all this. They just want to get you in the room and out of the room, give you a prescription or tell you what to do, but not hear your story and, 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 what's what's driving you and if you don't know that you can't help somebody yeah i agree with that and i, I just wanted to say just from in talk, in talking about emotional pain i know uh the apa american psychiatric association is with the new leadership is really creating a really a task force to address the social determinants of health which really asks the question instead of um what, why, why are you or examining the, the face value of what's happening? They're asking the question, what happened to you? And um, another book to throw out there is a book written by Oprah and Dr. Bruce Perry, who's a child psychiatrist. It's called What Happened to You and really goes into the impact of early life trauma on all of these 
bodily systems that were already mentioned, neuroendocrine system and um, the, all the hormones and the, the results of trauma. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to see at least psychiatry is taking that approach. And I know the field has done a lot of, of wrong historically with women, with minorities, um, that they're taking these steps to rectify it. And I'm just happy to see that and be in the, this, this time to see, this, to see some consistent change and intentional change. And I just want to say thank you for recognizing that. That has definitely been something I've experienced for many years. Um, my strength has always been my weakness. Um, people have looked at me and assumed that because I'm well positioned and presents and I can present well. And, and you know, I started this organization because I could not find anyone to mentor me when I got into gun violence intervention and realized that the number one cause of death of uh, death for black males 55 and under was homicide by firearm um, and then black women being disproportionately impacted but ultimately realizing that it was a black woman that was left with the children of the deceased or the black woman that was left to bury the deceased or the black woman that was left with caring for the deceased or the black woman that was left with the stigmatism that sits in her family now in that community if that person um, that had murdered someone else's child now lives around in this area in which normally uh, populations of people that see where there's uh, some people refer to black on black violence which is not you know the proper way to describe or ever say that, but when you have people that are living in poverty in these conditions, uh, in these close, close proximity, and they commit violent crimes against one another, there's that family that has to stay there because they don't have the means to leave or move. And so now you have to deal with that. And so Black women constantly are dealing with this uh, traumatic lifestyle. And the other uh, invisible conversation is for the most part, many of us, and, and Chidi is, uh, has the very rare um, understanding of who I am completely, but the very, um, the very, the hardest part for me is, is that with the organization that I, I had to start to help other women because I could not find it for myself, is that many of the women that are um, showing up in your spaces have suffered tremendously, um, whether it be rape, abuse, neglect. I myself came through foster care, to lost a twin sister. I mean, I've been through a lot and um, none of that was ever recognized. I'm 50 right now and I have never had a space, a soft landing spot. I have always had to be this that I am and I am not afraid. Uh, I have learned there is no reason to fear what man can do to me because ultimately there is a higher power for me that I'll answer to and I am living my best possible life. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation that has to be had and a lot of work to be done. Um, poly victimization, I didn't learn anything about that until three years ago. Um, and so just looking at what you know, we're all talking about here because this is beyond gun violence and the anti-racism conversations that have to be had. Uh, I think that they have to start with people that don't look like me. I taught for over 30 years grassroots advocacy. I conducted evidence-based research uh, workshops. I turned research into relationships. I would take research and turn that into organizing toolkits so that the community that's mostly impacted could understand what it is that you all are teaching us that we can't process or understand because most of us are in trauma and don't learn the same way because I don't know that I had any normalcy in my life until later on in my late 40s. Uh, and so childhood development, that's funny to me. Like what? I taught myself how to read how to do just about everything because of what I was experiencing. I never could pay attention or learn in school because of the trauma, but as a brown girl, no one paid attention to that. I was just mouthy or a problem. I wasn't anything but that. And so I say all that to say, you know, I, I do truly believe that this is an inside out 
um, piece of work that you have to, there's this old saying, each one, teach one, you've got to teach the one next to you. And then hopefully the one next to you will teach. And we're not going to get everyone to understand that racism is really going to be the center of the demise of this country, but it's also going to be the center of solutions. It is not just a saying that love can outshine hate. It is a reality, is that when people feel better, when they are validated and they're valued, then they do things differently. It, and I'll stop here just the other night, just an example for even with my dog, I took my grandchildren, I have a three-year-old um, and a six-year-old grandchild. God knows, I don't know, I was thinking I had them for the whole weekend. And they had so much energy that I took them to the beach and they ran around, they had fun, but I took the dog with us and the dog's never been to the beach. So she's running after the water and biting the sand and drinking the water. So naturally she gets sea, sea water poisoning. I forgot what they called it, but she was really sick. And it was moments before the, you know, I'm considering taking her in because I'd called the emergency vet about taking her in um, and they might have to keep her and, and give her some, some electrolytes or all the stuff they were telling me. I sat down on the floor with her for an hour because she had been sick for hours. And I sat down with her for an hour in my lap and I just sat there with her and she fell asleep. And after that hour, she got up and she was feeling a lot better. She wasn't better, but she was feeling so much better that she started walking around. And the next morning she woke up being herself. And in those moments I learned, just not with people, but with animals too, it's really how you treat people that matters. It's not just a saying from Maya Angelou about people remembering how you treat them. It's, it's life. How we treat each other is how we'll show up in the world. And that doesn't mean that you know every single person will show up the way they should. It just means that more of us will show up and that is more light than dark. That's beautiful too. And, and as a provider, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to show up for your patients. You have to really try to be there with them. You have to touch them. I mean, not inappropriately, but just touch can be so healing and uh, just be there with them and don't be looking at the computer the whole time and don't be looking at your watch and don't be trying to get out of the room. If you go over, then you'll make up the time somehow. Everybody thinks that they can't do that, but they can do that. Yeah, thanks so much, Kayla, for sharing. That was really insightful and I appreciate you sharing your experience as well. Um, just. In the interest of time, we wanted to open it up to everyone um, to kind of talk about our goals for 2022 for the group. Um, so Doctors for America <clears throat> is changing structure a little bit in 2022, but we're still gonna have our anti-racism um, subsection of the gun violence prevention group. So just wanna open the floor to anyone who has any ideas or suggestions. I think one thing that came out of this was um, potentially we could have a book club with some of the books that people mentioned. Um, and I had talked with um, Kayla about doing some trauma-informed care sessions, both for patients and for the caregivers as well um, in wellness and caring for ourselves. So I just wanna open it up if anyone else has suggestions or projects they wanna take on for the next year. I know that people were talking about a while ago, like constructing curriculum around this work. Um, I think it's really hard to do that because not that like, you can't put out like a toolkit or like, um, I don't know, like, you know, PowerPoint decks about certain things that you find important. Like I, you know, like a white paper, I guess I, I get. Um, but as at Sinai, we do have like pretty structured med student curriculum that um, has been, spearheaded from like-minded folks um but it's like only probably works because it's new york city and it's like quite progressive and we have those people pushing and sinai is still very racist but like you know they're trying to make inroads and so i think it's gonna like because it's so um institution based and i think that a lot of times there's maybe like you know as we know diversity is not 
there, medicine is not very diverse of a field generally. I think that it's so institutionally bound how much effort they put into um, uh, pushing these, what we want forward. I think it's gonna be really difficult to create and construct curriculum that can be easily um, like extrapolated at different sites. Um, so I, I don't know how much work there had been done about kind of going down that route, but I just find it will probably, in my experience with trying to create curriculum at some place that is still racist, but like more progressive than where I went to med school, um, it's gonna be like quite difficult um, because I think the institution's dedication to the cause, although problematic will vary. Um, so I think that like, other potential ideas would be like a book club, would be trauma-informed care. I don't think there's enough like clinical trauma-informed care, um, even like meta-analyses about all the things we were talking about earlier, like GFR and how it's BS, um, like even nitrate trials in, in Black people in terms of like CHF care. I think like that might make more of a difference, kind of collecting those together. Um, yeah, like, a, I, I guess like a journal club, but even like making those findings very public would be more helpful than like trying to create cons like prescriptive curriculum, I think with what we think is the way that we should go through med ed. So, um, yeah, that's great. I really appreciate all those points. Um, I think, yeah, that was one thing that we were doing initially was like kind of trying to construct curriculum, but then we kind of found that like you were saying, it's not gonna work for every institution. And we do have the toolkit, but I think what we kind of veered toward was doing more like advocacy work for physicians, teaching them how to advocate for this um, and doing education. So I, I, yeah, I really love all those ideas. So I wrote them all down. Thank you. There's a really good speaker uh, from the um, University of Chicago Pritzker Hospital. And they have really kind of partnered with the anti-racism uh, efforts in Chicago. And he wrote a book called The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills. And I've heard him speak and he, one of the things he does is talk about all the things that the hospital has done to address this in terms of education of physicians and uh, medical students and residents. Uh, and uh, it's a good book to read. And I think he'd be a good speaker too. Do you mind putting the name in the chat? Yeah, I'm, I'm about to put it. And okay. so it's not only him, it's how Pritzker Hospital has done that too. I just wanna say if anyone needs to head out, it's the top of the hour. So we really appreciate everyone being here and participating. Um, we'll definitely be in touch with next steps, but I'm happy to stay and hear any suggestions that people have. And just wanna thank um, Dr. Wamo and uh, Kayla for being with us this evening as well. I think one of the points that is my takeaway is how multi-faceted uh, the approach needs to be to um, address the problem. And while you're talking about curriculums, somewhere out there, it's already done. But I don't know who had, is the cut, most cutting edge. And the other thing is, um, instead of the organization taking on total role, is organizations need to have diversity and inclusion departments and efforts within their organizations. And I don't remember, I don't know if it's HRSA that does have a very good, and, and I can find it, I just can't remember exactly who started the, the form for assessing what it is in your organization. In other words, does somebody say they have a diversity and inclusion department, but you can't find them, you don't know where they work, uh, and it's not funded? That's slip service. But there, are, you know, we need to push for organizations to have more than lip service. We need to work on policies and um, at the education, attracting more people. I mean, we have to hit this on a lot of different levels. And there's a resistance to it. Uh, Jeff and I tried to get, we, work, we both worked for Kaiser 
and we tried to get the uh, Kaiser Retired Physicians Association to have a speaker on allyship uh, among physicians in medical training uh, to address health inequities and uh, racism, uh, structural racism in medicine. And we did all the groundwork. We got the speaker, she was okay to do it. We had the time and everything and the board voted it down. They said it was, what was it? What was the comment, Jeff, that they thought it was, uh, I don't non-medical. I, I don't remember, but you know, probably too political or something like that. But um, we had heard her speak before, and she was really excellent. Um, you know, and it was really on a, a very um, simple uh, and kind topic, allyship. It wasn't really, you know, it, and and that may be a question. Um, for this group as well. Um, I know others have felt like uh, a more, uh, a better term would be a uh, co-conspirator or something like that, rather than to indicate more having some skin in the game. Um, but uh, I think within uh, DFA, it would be good to recruit more people of color as well so that the decision makers are also um, you know representative uh, more representative of the population at large and I hope you're not going anywhere Chidi we could use you here and I learned a lot from what you said so um, you know please uh, know how much you're your talk was appreciated, and uh, and uh, Kayla, your willingness to to share and to be vulnerable, uh, I was kind of blown away. That was uh, so courageous and so kind of you to to do that. I thought. Thank you. I appreciate you all make make it safe, and um, it's the right place to to be vulnerable. Susan Rogers would be a great speaker, by the way. I just mentioned her in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think she speaks from a couple, couple different uh, arenas as far as disparities and um, education, health policy. Um, she's very good. Awesome, I appreciate everyone's input. I took all the notes that I could. So uh, really, really appreciate everyone's participation. And again, thank you all for joining and giving us great input. We'll be in touch about the next steps. We'll send some meeting notes as well, but um, feel free to send Allison or myself an email. I can share my email in the chat really quickly. Um, but thank you again for joining. Thank you very much.